pull him in, and I mean, he is just, he is crying, and there is remorse. And he kept telling me, Baba, forgive me. I, I disobeyed you. I will never disobey you again. I, you were right. You were right. And I told him, I said, I told you. No, I didn't. <laughs> I said, you know, Levi, the reason why I tell you to do something is because I, I have your best interests at heart. And I know. He goes, I know. I know you know. I know now. <laughs> And so we're praying, and then we saw the, the x-ray, and sure enough, he actually, it wasn't so much a broken arm as much as it was a fractured shoulder. And I mean, the crack was all the way through the bone. Bad break in a bad spot. So he's, oh, just broke my heart. I was like, oh. <laughs> so I'm holding him. We're crying, and I'm comforting him. In it's hard to hug him because you put your arm, and he's like, ow. <laughs> oh, I forgot. Okay. Obedience to the Father. Obedience to the Father. Why does God want our obedience? Because he knows what's best for us. Oh, would to God that we would obey him and not endure unnecessarily the pain of our disobedience. Verse 3, Then Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, Behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you, and I will make of you a multitude of people and give this land to your descendants after you as an everlasting possession. So he's repeating the promise uh, that was made to him at Luz, which another name for Luz is Be Betel. Remember Betel, Beit, house. Same word in the Arabic that it is in uh, Hebrew. Beit means house. House, El is Lord, Betel. So house of God. And this is where Jacob first met God and where the Lord revealed himself and unveiled his promise to him. Now, understand that heretofore, Joseph has not been, this promise has not been revealed to him yet. Well, what is the promise? That God is going to give them the land. Not the land of Egypt, the land flowing with milk and honey. He's giving it to Israel, not the Palestinians, not the Arabs. That is not their land. The land belongs to the Jew. I'll never forget when I first met a uh, Messianic uh, Jewish brother who also pastored a congregation here in uh, uh, on Oahu, actually in Waikiki. Actually, he had me go and speak for him at this Messianic congregation, which I thought was kind of dangerous to have an Arab come into a <laughs> Messianic Jewish congregation and speak, but on, on you know, Shabbat or on Sab Sabbath, on the Jewish Sabbath. And uh, his first question to me was, who does the land belong to? And my answer was, it belongs to you. <laughs> Not me and my people. It belongs, <laughs> it belongs to you. It belongs to the Jew. The land belongs to Israel. That was the promise made to them. There's another reason why he's repeating the promise. And by the way, isn't this interesting? It never hurts to repeat the promises of God. Sometimes I think it's imperative for us, especially when we're in the midst of a difficult trial, is to remind ourselves and repeat the promises of God. You know, that there's, one has counted some 3,000 promise, promises in the pages of Scripture that are made to three. That's a lot of promises. That's a lot of promises. But there's a reason, another reason why I believe it is that he is revealing this and repeating this promise to Joseph. He doesn't want Joseph to get too attached to Egypt. Remember now, Egypt is a picture of the world and things are going well. He's, he's at the zenith of his life. He's the most powerful man next to Pharaoh. 
Charles Spurgeon of this said, Jacob would not have Joseph fix his heart upon Egypt, but have a believing eye towards Canaan. Therefore, he speaks to him concerning it. We must ever guard against the loving, loving the world because things go smoothly with us. And isn't that actually what we're prone to do? When things are going well, we don't really, you know, long for the Lord's return. Conversely, when things are going not so well, we want the Lord to come back yesterday. I mean, truly, I, I, when I was at the hospital, I was talking to this gal and I was talking about the, the coming of the Lord. And, and she said, well, I'm not really, you know, thinking about that. And my, I didn't say it. My thought was, wow, things must be going well for you. No, think about it. Hey, when things are going good, it's kind of like, well, it's kind of like, you know, before you get married, Lord, don't come back until after we get married. Yeah. <laughs> then you get married. Lord, come quickly. <laughs> Please. <laughs> Before Elias was born, you know, because it took us 10 years. I, I mean that with all due respect. I have a, I have a great marriage because my wife is a, a great woman. And that's the reason why I have such a great marriage. There, I said it, and it's recorded. So, <laughs> was that a good save? Not really? Okay. <laughs> I'll stop while I'm not ahead. But uh, it's kind of like when, you know, we were going to have Elias, and we had waited so long to have children. I was like, Lord, please don't come back. This is 1998. Please don't come back until, you know, Elias is born. and Because we had already named him. <laughs> And then after he was born, he never slept through the night. And I remember in the middle of the night praying, God, you can come now. You can come now. Yeah, this would be good. This would be a good time. <laughs> okay, verse 5. <laughs> and now your two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, who were born to you in the land of Egypt before I came to you in Egypt, are mine. <laughs> As Reuben and Simeon, they shall be mine. So here he's about to pronounce the blessing, and what he does is kind of interesting. He's essentially adopting his grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and saying now to his son Joseph, your sons are now my sons. Why is Jacob doing this? He wants to bestow upon Joseph a double blessing because of how God has used him in his life. Notice he says that Ephraim and Manasseh will be as Reuben and Simeon. In a sense, he's positioning them as first and second born in the 12 tribes of Israel. Again, I'll borrow from Charles Spurgeon, who said, thus they were to be regarded as founders of distinct tribes and to have each of them a portion among the sons of Jacob. This sort of explains the 12 tribes and how they're listed in a different order throughout the scriptures. You know, sometimes they're listed with Manasseh and Ephraim in there, and sometimes they're not. But we see them oftentimes listed in the 12 tribes of Israel. One has noted that there are more than 20 different ways of listing the 12 tribes of Israel in the Old Testament. But there's always 12 tri tribes, but they're used interchangeably. And notice, again, it stays at 12 because of the significance of the number 12. One commentator said it this way, 12 is a number often associated with government or administration in God's eyes. There are 12 tribes, 12 apostles, 12 princes of Ishmael, 12 pillars on Moses' altar, 12 stones on the high priest's breastplate, 12 cakes of showbread, 12 silver platters, silver bowls, and gold pans for the service of the tabernacle, 12 spies to search out the land, 12 memorial stones, 12 governors under Solomon, 12 stones in Elijah's altar, 12 in each group of the musicians and singers for Israel's worship, 12 hours in a day, 12 months in a year, 12 Ephesian men filled with the Holy Spirit, 12,000 from 12 tribes sealed and preserved through the tribulation, Heaven has 12 gates of 12 pearls and 12 angels at the gates. The new Jerusalem has 12 foundations, each with the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. Its length, breadth, and height are 12,000 furlongs. And the tree of life in heaven has 12 fruits. 